welcome to CRM. I know you're all thinking about something in your head when you hear the acronym CRM. It may not be a nice thing, uh, based on the history of CRM going back 10, 20 years. So I've got a pretty quick agenda. Uh, I'm going to talk about three things. First off, I'm going to define what CRM is. And uh, then I'm going to say, well, why is CRM relevant for you guys in the room today? Why would I want to do a pipeline tracking system? Uh, secondly, uh, I'm going to look at the uh, Microsoft provided solution for NGOs. So that's taking CRM, extending it out to work within the NGO space. And then finally, um, I'm briefly going to talk about um, safer homes in New Zealand every day, um, just briefly, because I haven't got a huge amount of knowledge within uh, their solution. I'm here though. You are, and this is the IT queen, Kathy, I believe. Yes, so Kathy will chip in and, um, and correct me where I say something glaringly wrong. And then finally, um, Kerry, from the CEO from the Citizens Advice Bureau, will talk about their experiences implementing, I believe, to be the uh, second largest CRM implementation in New Zealand. That's not to say CRM isn't suitable for smaller business as well. So why CRM for not-profits? Let's talk about CRM first off. So CRM has been around for quite a while. Uh, you know, in one way, shape, or form, CRM is just data. You know, it's storing information about customers. It's traditional CRM. So customers and the relationships you have to those customers. And it allows you to see what their uh, full uh, life cycle has been with you, all of the interactions you have with that customer, uh, with the, you know, the emails you send, the meetings you have, the phone calls you make, the sales you might make, the events they might attend, everything you know about that individual or company and how they relate to, to you. I'm still talking about vanilla CRM, not not-for-profits. A good CRM system should also do some process automation. It should uh, follow best practice. And I will uh, come to a point that, uh, that uh, Earl mentioned this morning. So process automation for a, a variety of subjects, marketing, communications, etc. And then finally, it should also allow some, um, some allocation of tasks. So uh, dividing work between a team, a group of users, a sales force, as an example. So that's great. You're probably thinking, what, what did Earl say this morning? CRM? It's a pretty dangerous system, really. It, uh, there's some potential drawbacks to CRM. And the first one he said was, they sold us something we don't want and can't use. And you all went, <laughs> I understand exactly what he means. And he's quite right. Uh, traditional CRM a while back, the best practice trap, you would purchase a behemoth CRM system, you know, a, a juggernaut uh, which had this best practice template and it would map out how a not-for-profit or organization should operate. Regardless of the fact you're funded in different ways, you operate within different communities, you have uh, completely different uh, interactions with the individuals you deal with. Some of you, um, let's take the Royal Foundation for the Blind, have a guide dog management program. Whereas a Citizens Advice Bureau is obviously quite different from just a guide dog management program, but they're both not-for-profits. So there is a, you know, it's a, a very generic uh, thing to fall into by implementing a best practice template. Information is everything, and I couldn't have agreed more with Earl on this. It is just information. The, the value to any organization, not-for-profit or not, is the information they hold about the, uh, the people they are trying to, to serve or to sell to, or to maintain a relationship with. And all the system does is, is wraps that information in a meaningful, constructed way. Because it's the obedient servant. I love that. I'm going to use that everywhere. Unfortunately, I don't talk about CRM so much anymore. But that is so true. Because if you automate a poor business process, you're just going to have that process automated. It's going to carry on doing stuff wrong. And until you fix that process and fix the process within the system, it will carry on doing things wrong. So it does lock in the rules. So how is it a bit more relevant within the NGO space? How can we use a CRM system? So think of CRM as a platform. It's a framework that you can extend out. And at the heart of it is one thing that you deal with, the core tenant of your interactions. Now that might be, it might be a beneficiary, it might be a dog, it might be a customer. That could be an individual or an organization. It could be a member. It could be a constituent. So we have uh, produced and uh, um, 
I'm for, sorry, I forgot the name of the second speaker. I mentioned it earlier. The, um, I wasn't in the room at the time. But Microsoft have an NGO out of the box solution for, uh, for um, a kickstart, basically. And that includes a bunch of things. And, and it includes donors, volunteers, clients, and other things you may or may not deal with. So if you don't want to use donors because you don't ha you're not funded by donation management, you can just turn that off when the, within the solution. If you don't run events, you can turn that off as well. If you'd like to err on another aspect, say a victim like Shine has, or a, uh, a perpetrator, you can model those pieces of information inside the CRM system. And because they're then modeled in the system, you can build around them to track the interactions you have with them, the emails you receive, send, the one-on-one -on -one meetings, and how those individual pieces of information relate to each other as well. And that's what CRM should allow you to do. Once you've got all of that data in your system and modeled, then you can start using some of the other features of a CRM system. So simply reporting be a good example. I can start analyzing the information I've got stored in my system and produce meaningful reports to see where I should be focusing my efforts. So I could be doing it for, I could be using my workflow as well for, for case management. When I receive a, a request that comes in for some help, I should assign that request to someone with the skills to serve the person who's asking for help. So route it to the appropriate person. And then let that person know that they have something to act on. It's a fairly simple process. You get a request, send it to the right person to, to, to satisfy the request. So by doing that with the process, you can start dividing up the workloads, uh, having uh, case management, queuing items, those sorts of things, uh, outbound calls, all of those aspects can be dealt with in CRM. And an important note, CRM will work for any size organization. Probably not very beneficial for a single person uh, because they've really got most of the information up here. But you know, sort of from levels of five and above is where you're really going to get some real, some real benefit. You all have CRM systems. You may not have dynamic CRM. You may not have one of our competing products. But I can guarantee who, who's got access? Oh, it was actually far lower than I thought. Access is probably the most pervasive system uh, used for tracking data because it's very easy to build up and model information inside Microsoft Access and produce quick reports. But you all have systems. You have spreadsheets. You have contact folders. You have all sorts of things. So this is the solution that uh, you can go and look at this um, and you know, yeah, write it down. You can head there straight after this and uh, look at the solution currently. Because we've only got Serum Online, Nigel mentioned it earlier, we've only got Serum Online available in North America. We're expecting that in New Zealand in January. When we go live, uh, the online offering, you will be able to, as a not-for-profit, get access to this not-for-profit solution. And that solution includes all of these aspects. And I'm going to show you a few of those in the next few slides. So you can use them. You, you don't have to use them. Or you can just use Serum as it is out of the box and change it. Now, one of the important features, and I was, I was discussing this with Kerry, and, and certainly something that she's going to reinforce um, a little later on, is how much does CRM fit? And the analogy I often use is going into uh, somewhere to buy a suit. So I could go into a suit maker, and I can grab a suit off the rack that's already there, and I can put it on, and it might fit. It's pretty unlikely it's going to fit, because you know I'm, I'm huge. It's going to struggle to go across my massive shoulders. That's not really it at all. Um, it may fit, it may not fit. It's probably going to need some tailoring. It'll need some adjustment. And getting that tailoring done may be very cheap. It also may be very expensive. The more you tailor the system, the more tightly it becomes aligned to what it is that you want to do, probably the more expensive that tailoring is going to become. That's a pr pretty important fact to, 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 uh, to get across. So let's look at some of the features. So you may or, may or not use aspects of these. One of the most important things about Dynamic CRM is the fact it sits within Microsoft Outlook. So uh, currently it's 2003, 2007, and when we get version 2011, it'll be within Outlook 2007 or 2010. Doesn't mean you have to use Outlook. That's one of the choices. You can always use a, also use a web browser. And the reason that Microsoft talks about the integration with Outlook endlessly is because Outlook is, is a... Uh, probably the foremost productivity tool in the world. It's familiar. People are used to firing up Outlook, seeing their email there, and if we embed CRM within Outlook, it's very easy to click an email and associate that with, with someone who you've just received the email from, or start a workflow from it. Rather than having to switch from one application to another, 
you stay within the one place, and you reduce the training effort because you're just extending a product that people are already familiar with. Hopefully. You may not have Outlook. In which case, the interface within Internet Explorer is very similar. Very, very similar. Very intuitive. Very office look and feel. <coughs> and one of the important features about Outlook is that you can take it offline. If you don't want to, uh, if you're not connected to your, you know, to your system and you're out in the field, which is going to be quite common with a fair few of you, you can still have access to all of your data while you're out in the road through Outlook. Run reports, add new records, update information. So here's some of the features within that solution. Again, we've got member and constituent management. So members might, uh, members um, are a, uh, an, an organization or a household, as an example, or a family, and a constituent might be an individual. So that might be the core part of your system. And you look at all of the things that's relating you to that constituent. Are they, uh, do they have a membership program? You know, have they made uh, donations or a, or a pledge to not donate in the future? Do they have, uh, you know, the, the common things that describe who that, that person is or that organization is? Do they have an address? Do they have multiple email addresses? Do they have phone numbers? You store it all in one place. So rather than have, having, an, and this will probably strike a chord with some of you, rather than having information dumped all over the place, in people's folders, and people's, um, on people's desks and spreadsheets, we amalgamate it in one place and we call it the single source of the truth. It's a single version of the truth, one place, you update it in one place, and then it's available for everybody. Donation management, for those of you funded by donations, uh, and you can relate those donations to the source of the donation, perhaps the target of the donation as well. What are we going to use this donation for? You could then uh, hook that donation up and make it available to the website. So people can donate via the website, record that in the system, and then you kick off a process down the bottom here, which sends them a thank you email. Thanks very much. Maybe if it's a really big donation, you get the CEO to give them a call, a call and say, thanks, that was, that was an especially good donation, and uh, they invite them out for dinner, something like that. Membership management. Once again, it's all about relating the different aspects. Uh, so you could link up the membership with a constituent or a member. Wow, time flies. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and, and track the duration of that membership as well. Once again, you can look at all of this information online. Campaign management. Let's say we invited all of you along to the room today, which we did. We could easily track that within CRM. And we could do the follow-ups as well. So everyone who came along, we send them a thank you email for attending. We enter them into a drawer for a couple of Xboxes. We track whether or not they enjoyed the event through a survey, and then we can go and look at it in a year's time when we want to rerun the event, which we probably will, and judge the success of what our event is like based off the feedback forms you fill in this afternoon. So talk briefly about um, the non-generic spiel I've just given you and how we can actually tailor CRM for some specific uses within New Zealand. So first off, I'll talk about Safer Homes in New Zealand Every Day, which was formerly Preventing Violence in the Home. Um, so they're obviously a registered charity based in Auckland, um, been going now for about two years? 20 years. 20 years. So that shows my, um, my lack of knowledge. And uh, obviously their mission statement is, is fairly clear. They believe everyone should be safe in their, in their own home. Something we probably take for granted. So what were they trying to do with, uh, with a new system? Not necessarily CRM, but they ended up with CRM. They wanted a best practice model, which is going to reinforce their goals of, of client safety uh, backed by effective service. And they had traditionally, and I mentioned access before, they had an access system, um, which was probably a little bit underwhelming, yes. satisfactory for a while, but as organizations grow and flex, you rapidly outgrow your IT and you need a uh, more extensible platform that say more than five people can access at once, as an example. Uh, of course, they were constrained by funding. Um, NGO sector, not flush with funds, so they needed a cost-effective way of building up a tailored solution. And key, because of the amount of data they store, and you can imagine the patterns that you would detect in uh, domestic violence, um, being able to analyze reporting uh, with, with business insight to be able to see, you know, even predictive uh, analysis, uh, potentially, um, of where they can uh, focus their efforts in the future and identify high-risk victims. So what did they receive? Um, a customized version of Serum, of course, because that's what I'm talking about, um, delivered by a local partner based here in New Zealand. That's a key point, which is on the next slide. What does it allow them to do? So it's tracking referrals where the uh, you know, a potential incident is reported. Um, gives them a, a full, fully-fledged reporting system to drill into information. 
and it uses the workflow within the system to um, assign the appropriate uh, advisor to the, um, to the case as it comes in. So, some key considerations. And uh, Kerry's going to talk about uh, some of these from her perspective as well for the Citizens Advice Bureau. But I'd reinforce all of these that have been made by, by Shine. Um, first off, there must be some alignment. There has to be some vision around why the system's being put in place. And there has to be some, um, some comeback on that. So adoption is key for any CRM system. And unless it's being driven from the top, it's very hard to get a CRM system adopted uh, and, and used successfully. CRM must be configured uh, to be appropriate for the organisation. Um, otherwise, it's that, that, you know, the ill-fitting suit that I described before. And you must find a good partner to configure software. You guys could get the CRM CD if you wanted to do an on-premise install. You could buy a server, you could plop it in there, and you could start it running, and you'd have a working CRM system. But I can guarantee that would probably fail in 95% of cases. You could take it a little further, you could invest in some of your own staff, you could get them trade up on CRM, and you might get to sort of 60% success rate then. But to get the system right in the first place, it has to be implemented aligned to what your requirements are. And we would suggest you do that with a partner or someone who's done a CRM implementation before. Because each one of these that you do, the better you get at it. And, and CRM can be configured in so many different ways that you can paint yourself in a corner. And then finally, you must invest in, in, in useful training for your employees. Anything to add, Cathy? The training needs to be ongoing. Yep, ongoing training. Good point. New, new staff come on. Uh, you, you might have customer cha or champions within the business who are you know, experts at the system. They need to uh, bring on those new people. And that's probably enough of me talking. I'd like to hand over to Kerry Dalton, the CEO of the Citizens Advice Bureau, to talk about <coughs> her experiences with CRM. Um, hello everybody. As it says, my name's Kerry Dalton and I'm from the Citizens Advice Bureau and I'm a chief executive that is just emerging out of an organisational transformation process that's taken three years, um, of which an, a new IT system is, is a key part. Um, what I would say in relation to what Dirk said is that our project has been driven from the bottom up and in, in our organisation that's been absolutely critical and um, we learnt, but we started off thinking that what we were doing was an IT project and we learnt pretty fast that it wasn't, it was actually about thinking through every aspect of the organisation to ensure that um, we ended up operating the way that um, we expected to to be effective going into the future. So, Aha, uh -huh. thank you. Um, so for those of you who uh, may not know much about Citizens Advice Bureau, um, we are an information organisation, <laughs> so we sit in that space um, and interestingly, prior to the change process that we've just been through, we didn't have an effective web presence. Um, so there was a huge driver for change to make sure that the service that we offer was accessible to people and um, that we acknowledge there's a, a new community that's developed and that's a web-based community and we weren't there, um, which meant that our, we weren't delivering as effectively as we could on our aims, which is to ensure that um, people do not suffer from not knowing about their rights and responsibilities and services that are available to them. Um, so the structure of the organisation, we're a federation structure, which means I'm the chief executive, <laughs> but I'm the chief executive of an, an organisation where each member is autonomous, so they have their own management committees, their own governance structure, and their own paid staff. Those staff do not report directly to me. Um, our service is delivered by 2,700 trained volunteers, all of whom choose to be part of the organisation because of what they want 
to contribute to their community and they can choose to leave if they don't like what's going on in the organisation, just like that. Um, we're a national organisation, so we've got a dispersed national structure. We operate out of 92 service delivery sites from Kitty Kitty down to Invercargill. Um, so one of, one of the imperatives that we were looking at, I've told you about, which is that we've got, we had a wealth of, of information in the CAB. We've been operating for 40 years in New Zealand, and part of our, our service, because we deliver a universal service, which means that if people come in with a, a need to know about anything, then we move to assist them, is that we keep a database of other organisations that are specialists or who operate in a particular area so we can refer people to them. And we have around 40,000 organisations and services um, and they were all locked in separate databases. So 92 databases and um, that wasn't available on the web. So the way that people could access that information was by either coming into a CAB, ringing a CAB. So, and, and a lot of work going into researching local organisations and services, very localised information, which is incredibly valuable, and updating it, and it, it, it wasn't as nearly as accessible as it could be. So that was one of the key drivers, and that was to have a national database, which, which was a repository for all of our information. Um, and the other was to make that information available on the web. So the CR, what, what, actually before I go to CRM specifically, um, yes. So, getting our head around, this is not an IT project. It actually involves a whole process of the organisation re-evaluating the way we needed to operate. So, um, one of the um, accelerants to what we were doing was we actually got funding from the Community Partnership Fund the, from in, under the government's digital strategy and suddenly we were actually um, in a position of being able to realise our dreams. We'd done a, a visioning exercise as an organisation um, which is what I refer to as um, from the, the ground up. So this was a vision that the organisation held of being accessible and available and giving people choice via being available on the web to access the service. And that was incredibly important for the project because that was the touchstone always that we went back to. In an organisation like ours, it had to be what people could relate to and what they could commit to, and it all went back to organisational values and vision. Um, so the strategic framework was developed and adopted by the organisation. Then we went through a process of um, looking at what we needed. And just, just to illustrate this, we... Um, and here I stand as a chief executive, as one of the chief executives that uh, Earl described that doesn't know much about IT at all. Um, and in the end, I think that ended up serving the organisation well because it meant that I needed to understand, as did the rest of the organisation, always what was the purpose, what was it driving, how did it relate back to what we were trying to achieve ultimately for our clients and for the volunteers in the organisation. Um, and when we started, we actually didn't have a dedicated IT person. We were um, we're a national organisation, <laughs> but um, the Bureau essentially grassroots and we're very, very limited in funding at the national level. We didn't have a dedicated IT person and what we did was actually approach one of our funders who we have a good relationship with, IRD actually, and, um, and they seconded to us an IT, one of their IT strategists, not full time, but part time, and he stayed with us through the whole project and helped us actually write the application to the Community Partnership Fund um, because it required 
information on, on IT, which we didn't have. So um, those aspects, all of those aspects were involved in, in the project, and a lot of them aren't IT based. The content development, huge. The whole issue of, of migrating data from these <laughs> 92 separate um, databases into one national database. And of course, there wasn't necessarily consistency across how people had been um, entering that information. So um, yeah, it was, it was a, um, something that the whole organization had to get its head around in terms of, of planning for changes in, in organizational processes. Hmm. So, what I would say in terms of, well, firstly, we, all, all CABs in New Zealand started operating off one IT system. Uh, it got launched on the 1st of July this year. And the website got launched on the 21st of September this year. Um, prior to that, 2,600 volunteers had to be trained in a new IT system, and a lot of those volunteers were not confident. Um, and in fact, one of the mistakes that we made early on in the project was to call it a digital strategy. <laughs> Um, and we had to reel back from that all the way through the project. Um, in the end, we ran a competition um, within the organization for a name, which is Cabinet. Um, so a volunteer ended up naming it. And the, the difference that that made in terms of the way that people could embrace and think about it was actually huge. Um, the other thing was that we used a process of collaboration and participation all the way through the project. So um, we brought, truly, it was, it was grassroots up, we brought the organisation together in multiple ways to design how the system would work. So we acknowledged it was the internal expertise of the people delivering the service and supporting those to deliver the service that needed to design the system. So. Um, we started, we, we brought a project manager on board in um, the end of 2007, and the system didn't end up starting to be built until mid-2009. All of that time was about designing and establishing the needs for the organisation. Um, we didn't engage, so the project manager came on board at the end of 2007, and we didn't end up um, contracting with a technology partner until um, the end of 2008, November 2008. All of that time was discussing and consulting with the organisation about how we could best operate to meet the needs of clients and to support vol the volunteers who are delivering the service. Um, we used a process of focus groups, bringing the organisation together around specific and certain areas. Um, working groups who looked at smaller issues coming out of that, subject matter experts who looked even in more detail at specific things, and, but we didn't end up excluding anyone. We asked who would like to have input into this, and we, um, whoever, whoever wanted to, we found a way of involving them, and one of those ways was also what we called reality checkers. So once things had been developed, in terms of this is the way we think we're going to operate, out it goes to the organisation as a whole, to reality checkers, and they say, nah, yep. And one of the issues in a dispersed organisation was that not every single bureau was operating the same way. So with, as Dirk was saying, with CRM, it, it does drive consistency. Ours was very, very customised. So we started off establishing our needs, um, contracted with Datacom, who was the technology provider. Um, CRM was part of the, the solution, um, and it got quite heavily customised to meet what um, our needs as an organisation were. Um,
<laughs> so those are some of the, the learnings um, that we had. Um, all I can say is that communication and consultation were absolutely critical. The change management process, which our organisation had to spend so much time on because our, our workforce, as you would call it, are volunteers. And, I mean, interestingly, hearing about the fear of people losing their jobs, our volunteers were scared that they were going to lose their jobs. What happens when all of the information is on the web? Does, what does that mean for us? So our organisation had to work through those processes and made the decision based on our values that, that we wanted to make as much of our information available as possible for people so they had the choice to use the web to help themselves. Um, I probably missed out some. Do you want to go back to the previous slide? Um, the other thing is implementing the system. Um, we ended up training two people in every single bureau. They were volunteers. So volunteers signed up to do more training. They were absolutely critical. Having people in the actual place to support people um, and give them confidence was absolutely critical. Uh, and also we've got an ongoing technical support, um, which is an 0800 number <laughs> for the Bureau to ring. It comes through to national office, and that's been absolutely vital and critical as well um, to giving people confidence. Um, our project manager, who, um, Diane Edwards, at, um, came to us with an incredible background in change management and learning and development as well. And she brought that to our organisation. She was perfect um, for our organisation and spent a long time also um, making sure that what we ended up getting built was what we needed. Um, one of the things I've, I've learned a few technology terms, um, and um, once, once you sign off on the functional specifications, <laughs> um, then you know, you're going to end up living with it. So it's very, very important to do the thinking up front. Our heads hurt because um, really CRM for our organisation is about integration. Um, integrating, and we, were, we are a national organisation, and we thought that we were operating largely in the same way, but technology is, you know, drives consistency, so it's really important to be clear about what, what your organisation needs. <laughs>